Tuesday, June 6, 2023, Maneco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. So today we've got Clive Thompson on. Uh, Clive, uh, welcome to the uh, to the show. Well, good morning, Mario. Um, I, I actually had a very nice and unusual breakfast this morning because one of your viewers got in touch with me by LinkedIn and sent me a pot of Marmite, which is virtually impossible to buy here in Switzerland. Uh, if we want one, we've got to travel over to France, and then you can only buy the 125 gram jars at a oh, five or six euros. And uh, he bought me one in the UK and sent it over with some uh, a, a bottle of beer and a Cadbury's chocolate. Uh, <laughs> must have cost him an absolute fortune, but uh, that's a guy called Josh C. I'll call him, uh, I won't say his full name, but thank you very much, Josh C. And I love eating some English food for a change. Yeah, Marmite. I like Marmite. Uh, uh, I guess it's uh, you either hate it or love it, Marmite. Anyway, uh, I've got Clive on because he wants to talk about a serious, a very serious topic uh, about how when countries start borrowing to pay the interest on, on the debt, and that's when you're really going downhill quickly. And Clive is going to go through the numbers today. But before we do, uh, you might find this strange. I, I want to share uh, a, an article or something that Kim.com, some of you might know who he is, but he's like a internet entrepreneur. He's originally German, but I think he lives in New Zealand. And he wrote this yesterday, uh, June 5th, and um, I think it was a tweet. He said, this may be the most important thread I ever make, big picture stuff about the major global collapse that is coming. I will try to help you understand why the future is not what we're hoping for. It's worse than most can imagine. Our leaders know, but they're but what are they planning? And I'm not going to go through the whole article. I'm going to put a link for you guys in the description but he goes over the stuff that I've been talking about. Clive has been talking about the huge chronic uh, budget deficits, uh, the money printing, as you can see here. Uh, this, this is Jay Powell on 60 Minutes saying, yes, we print, we print money and we buy treasuries and that injects cash into the economy. Uh, and then Kim.com does a, a pretty simple but really... Uh, powerful analysis here. He goes over the total debt of the United States, not just the government, but public, private, corporate, which is 90 trillion. Uh, he adds the unfunded liabilities. So the US is uh, in debt to the tune of almost 260 trillion. And then he subtracts uh, US assets, everything that's worth something in the US. And that's 193 trillion. And he comes to a uh, a negative balance of 66 trillion, <laughs> which is huge, of course. Uh, the world GDP, uh, for example, is almost 100 trillion a year. So, Clive, I'm going to stop at that and let you uh, talk about what you found, uh, which I thought was really interesting. It's to do with uh, how much interest the treasury potentially will be paying on the debt and that they might have to finance it i think we are approaching uh 800 billion 900 billion a year but uh yeah i'll let you um take well, over let, let's start with the recent decision to raise the debt limit in the united states um first of all what they've done is they haven't raised the debt limit they've got rid of it uh, and they're going to decide again in a year and a half if they will have one in January 2025. So right now, there is no debt limit whatsoever. It's it's literally a free-for-all. Uh, they can fill their boots uh, with debt. They can uh, print and borrow as much money as they please. Uh, obviously, it depends who they borrow from, whether it's the Federal Reserve or the public at large, but the, the plan is to borrow from the public at large in general. Uh, literally, the debt ceiling is now unlimited, at least for the next year and a half. How many dollars will be borrowed? Well, look, it's as much as they could shovel out of the door. And there's no restraint, no dollar amount. It's a free for all. Uh, they might have a cut here or there. But honestly, I can tell you there won't be any cuts in the spending and it's going to exceed the budget. And so what I wanted to do today is um, two things. Uh, just point your readers in the direction of where they can look uh, if they want to know how the 
government sees its own spending going. And secondly, to look at what happened in the past, how their forecasts got it wrong. And thirdly, how it will look if they get it wrong this time around. And I think they are going to get it wrong. And I'll explain why in a minute. And if they do get it wrong in the way I think, we won't be very long before the interest on the national debt of the United States exceeds their total tax take. So if I could just start, Mario, by, by sharing a screen. Um, yeah. Let me bring uh, bring this up. Uh, do you do you now see uh, uh, the, the screen from the Confederal uh, Budget Office, which has got various dates on it? Yeah, the Congressional Budget Office, CBO, yeah. Yeah. So uh, anyone could go go to this website and click on uh, at, at the top. Uh, you can see the ten-year budget projections, and down here you can see the long-term budget projections, which go out a long way. So if I just click uh, here, you can see how it's looking at the moment, um, and you can see what they see as revenues, social security, Medicare, uh, and so on uh, for the current for twenty twenty-three and year by year. The, Line which is highlighted in yellow, the the row, the the, the column yeah. in yellow, that's the de debt held by the public as a percentage of GDP. Currently, they say it's ninety eight percent. They're forecasting uh, it's going to gradually rise and rise and rise by twenty thirty three, which is the year I'm going to focus on. They think it will be one hundred eighteen percent of GDP, but if you look out further they're going to 194% of GDP. But we don't need to go that far because the dollar's not going to last that long anyway. Um, so that was my first... Uh, and you'll see this on that website if you click on one of the years. Uh, but what I'm looking at now is how they saw things back in 2012. So if you look at 2012, the debt held by the GDP, or uh, uh, debt as a percentage of GDP, where my cursor is, uh, in 2012, they saw it at 73% of GDP, and by the 2023, the line, the the row in blue, they saw it as 61% of GDP. Now, remember, we were just looking at a second ago; it was 90. I'll look at that again. And they saw that coming. Yeah, yeah, they saw that coming down to 55% by 2033. So let's line those two up together, and in orange or uh, light pink, you can see. Uh, the line, the numbers as they saw them in 2012, and you can see them as they see them here in 2023. So, for example, in 2012, they saw the debt to GDP would be by 2023 be 61%. In fact, it was 98%. They got it wrong. Back then, they saw the debt to GDP in 2033 as being 55%. They now reckon it's going to be 118%. The reason why the debt is going up so much and so fast is literally the government is overspending versus their budget. Um, I just flipped to a quick slide here. Uh, and if you look on the far right hand column, you see how their projections for 2022 went. Uh, back in 2012, they saw it at, at 15, uh, 15 trillion of debt held by the public. Uh, by 15, it was 18 trillion. By 2019, it was 19 trillion. This is what they saw for, for the current year. Uh, by 2020, they saw it as 20 trillion. And by May, they saw it as 20, nearly 25 trillion. So their projections are constantly changing upwards because the government is spending more than they expect. And if you go to the website of the CBO, you can see year by year, as I show here, uh, this is the 10-year forecast, and highlighted in blue, you can see the absolute number of debt held by the public. This is the debt which is held by you and I, by your pension fund, by the government of China, for example. It's not the debt held by the Federal Reserve, which is on top of this. So they see this, according to the latest budget, which was just revised a few days ago. Um, they see this, and by the way, it's revised upwards, meaning they're spending more than they saw back in February. Uh, they see the debt in 2022 going from 24 trillion to by 2033 46 trillion. That is the CBO's forecast. But as I said, they've got it wrong so many times in the past. So what if they get it wrong by these same percentages as they got it wrong in the past? So I'm just going to scroll down here and look at how far they got it wrong. So 
various columns here. I've got the revenue column as they saw it in 2012 and as it actually turned out. In 2012, they saw they were going to get 5.2 trillion of revenue. They actually got 4.9 difference minus 6%, which is about half a percent a year cumulative uh, difference over the 10, 11 years period. Uh, same thing for outlays. The outlays were higher. So revenues were lower than expected. Outlays were higher than expected by 12.6%. Uh, the deficit, because of the cumulative effect of those two, is 354% worse than they budgeted for or expected. And we'll see the debt held by the public is 60% worse, whereas federal debt's 44% worse. Uh, one thing which worked in their favour, or worked in the government's favour, was interest rates. Back in 2012, they forecast that they'd be paying 2.82% in interest over the next decade, uh, at least uh, by 2022 in interest. And actually in 2022, they paid 1.54% in interest. So that did actually save the government some money. But despite that, we ended up with a very serious uh, deficit. Yeah. And now I'm going to just wanted to add one thing. Um, we've seen in the last 12 months and even 18 months that uh, a, a lot of the uh, countries that help finance the, the U.S. debt, uh, the Chinese government and foreign investors, uh, they're starting to try to uh, diversify away from the dollar. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think that will I, I'm wondering if the CBO uh, realizes that that there's a huge move to de-dollarize. Uh, and I think that would uh, make things even worse. Yeah, certainly I can confirm that around the world we see uh, treasuries reducing their exposure to dollar, uh, but not actually the UK who's increased it. Um, don't ask me why the UK is a bit of an outlier there. Yeah. But uh, the fact is that uh, the major dollar holders are, apart from the UK, are reducing oh, their exposure why, to the dollar. Did, did you know that the UK, uh, during World War II, they had a land lease program, the US for the UK, for the war? And the, the UK only stopped paying that debt in 2020. <laughs> Just to let Wow. <laughs> no, I didn't know that. Okay. Anyway, shall, shall we have a quick look at what would happen if the extent to which they got it wrong in the past, they get it wrong by the same percentage going forwards? So, the uh, looking, we're now looking at the year 2020, 2033, which is 10 years out, the year I want to focus on. Uh, the CBO is reckoning they're going to get 7.10 or 7.10 trillion dollars of revenue and they reckon they're going to spend 9.96 trillion so big deficit of 2.8 or nearly 3 trillion dollars that's what they estimate the figures are but what if those numbers are wrong by the same percentage as they got it wrong a decade ago in other words the actual outcome they have six percent less revenue and they have 12 percent more outlays well we end up not with a deficit that year of 4.56, uh, not with a deficit of 2.86 trillion, but with a deficit of 4.56 trillion, which, when you work through the numbers, translates into the debt being held by the public going from 46 trillion, remember it's 24 trillion at the moment, yeah, 46 trillion in 2033 to 74 trillion. In other words, wow. three times as much as it is today in a decade. If their numbers are just slightly wrong, we're talking about a uh, half a percent a year difference in the revenue and 1% a year difference in the outlays, which is what actually happened in the past. If that happens, on the far right-hand corner where you see my cursor above the yellow box, you can see the net interest expense based on an interest rate of 4.55%, which is the current yield on the two-year treasury. So we're assuming by 2033, the current yield of 4.55 is still the same. You'll see that they're going to have an interest expense of 3.43 trillion, which is just over half of their revenue for the year. So more than 50% of their revenue will be going to pay the interest on the national debt. But what if the interest rate move to something along the lines of where we were in the 1980s, and I think this is more than possible for reasons which I'll explain in a minute, which I put in 8.9%. And we must remember, 
in 1980s, interest rates were almost never below 8%. One, there was only one year when it dropped to 7%, but almost never below 8%. And mostly, or many years, it was above or at 15%. So I put it 8.9%. So if the interest rate was to go to 8.9% by 2033, in yellow, the interest expense would be $6.71 trillion, exceeding the, the possible revenue of 6.6 trillion dollars so they would have nothing to spend after paying the interest on the national debt so the only way to spend money would be to borrow from peter to pay paul uh, now i, I just stop sh uh, i'll just stop sharing temporarily here uh mario yeah so we have to bear in mind uh the outcome is very uncertain it's a bit like a game of chess uh, you know, when a grandmaster's playing a game of chess, he makes his first few moves. He might be able to guess how the board will look two or three moves later, but 10 moves out, he hasn't got a clue. And it's the same with forecasting for the uh, the congressional budget uh, that they're doing. Their forecasts, as they stretch out, are nothing more than pie-in-the-sky guesses as to what the figure will be. But I'm going to tell you why I, I think their figures are going to be wrong. And there's two major reasons for that. Uh, the first reason is the assumption that they are making uh, about the amount the government will spend. Uh, they've always got it wrong, and the government has always spent more than they budgeted. Now, it's not their fault that they get the wrong number in there. They have no choice. They have to put in the official budget what the government plans to spend. But we all know the government spends more than expected. That's just the way the governments are. Uh, but they can't put in make-believe numbers, I, the government says we're going to spend a million, they can't put in one and a half million, that makes no sense. So they've got to put in the government's official number. That's the first reason why these numbers are going to be wrong, because we know from their track record the government spends more than they'll say they spend. But the second reason why it's going to be wrong is the interest rate that they are assuming. They are assuming that over the life of the debt, uh, sorry, over the life of the next 10 years, the average interest rate they'll pay on the national debt is... 2.9%. And in the last year, they reckon it will be 3.2%. Now, both of those interest rates are way below the current interest rate. It's, it's unlikely that we'll see interest rates of that low over the period, particularly since, according to their own numbers, they want to borrow the, the double the amount they borrow from the public at large, and according to my calculation, virtually triple it or potentially triple it. Uh, you can't ask the public, the government of China, your pension fund, my, uh, me and you, to lend more money to the US government unless they offer a higher interest rate than at the moment. It's not going to happen. So realistically speaking, those interest rates that they are forecasting are of 2.9% on average and 3.2 terminal rate are way too low. Those rates will have to rise. Uh, the only way they won't rise is if the Federal Reserve buys all that debt. But that's not what's in the plan. The plan is that the public at large will buy the debt. Uh, obviously, if the Federal Reserve buys the debt, they can buy it at whatever interest rate they're liking and manipulate interest rates much lower than they should be. And that's what we've had in the last decade when interest rates were manipulated downwards to nearly zero. But the Federal Reserve, with their words about quantitative tightening, aren't actually uh, saying that they will buy debt. Um, having said that, in the official plan, uh, there is nevertheless uh, an official, uh, in the CBO's plan, there is a plan for the Federal Reserve to keep buying debt. Uh, they say, I'm just looking for, yeah, they, they expect that the Federal Reserve will buy, uh, da, 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 let's have a look. Yeah, because the Federal Reserve, when they buy, it's not debt held by the public. So the Fed could buy yeah. like uh, 10 trillion, keep rates down around two or three, and uh, all those projections work. But but then the value of the dollar just goes down the, down the tubes, uh, I would say, if the Fed were to do that. I don't, I don't have the figure in front of me at the spur of the moment, yeah. but the, the point is the Federal Reserve, according to the CBO's plan, is going to buy some of that debt uh, on top of the huge doubling, nearly doubling of debt that they foresee for the public at large. So if the Federal Reserve does 
buy it, of course, that's quantitative easing and that's inflationary. But if the Federal Reserve was to buy a lot of this debt, which is targeted to go to the public, then that will be extremely inflationary. So one way or the other, we're going to end up with a very difficult situation. Um, uh, either the Federal Reserve manipulates rates lower by buying all this debt, and we have massive inflation with very low interest rates, or they sell it to the public, and we'll have very high interest rates to such a point that the US government will be paying out all of its all of its uh, revenues in interest and some and have nothing left to spend. Um, just a, a, another comment on the uh, bill which has just passed uh, in Congress where they've agreed to raise the debt limit to infinity temporarily. Um, the spending cuts that are imagined in there are absolutely illusory. Uh, the, if, if you look at it, uh, we've got... Um, isn't the uh, bill called the uh, Fiscal Responsibility Act? Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, it's 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 been. Uh, uh, I think they had another name for it earlier, which was uh, spent. Uh, had something like spending cuts in it, but they've got rid of that. Um, but if you if you look at it, two thirds of the spending uh, by the federal government is going to be on Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, Social Security, uh, which they call mandatory. That's going up by five percent this year. Uh, so no cuts there. Um, and those those agencies are not in good shape. They're all running out of money and they're going to go for, go be bankrupt. I think the time scale is approximately 10 years when they'll be bankrupt. Uh, but nobody, so there's no responsibility there. Nobody's going to do anything about that. So that's two thirds. There's no attempt to cut. That leaves only one third they've got to play with, which is called discretionary spending. But half of that's military so that's uh, that leaves one sixth. The military they're putting up the budget by three percent. Uh, so you've got one sixth less left, which is what's called the um, uh, the non-military discretionary spending. Even if you eliminate that one sixth, one hundred percent of it eliminated to zero, get rid of it all, the budget still won't balance they will still be spending more money than they're taking in taxes. Um, and just to illustrate, there's a very, very good speech by Senator Rand Paul. Um, he gave a few days ago, you look it up on YouTube, uh, in which he illustrates some of the ways the government is spending money, uh, which is a complete waste of time. Uh, he, he, he cited one of the government agencies, which is the National Science Foundation, and uh, he cites studies that the government is spending money on, such as what makes people fall in love. Uh, they spent a million dollars having young people take selfies of themselves to see how they feel later in the afternoon to see if it makes them feel happy. They spent one and a half million dollars on a study of the mating calls of Panamanian frogs to see if the mating call of a country frog is different from the city frog. These and, and you know, this goes on. Th these are the kind of ridiculous things the government is spending on money on, which could be cut literally 100%. Another example, they're, they're doing a study to see if the Japanese quail is more promiscuous when it's on cocaine. I mean, do the public at large really want to pay taxes to know these kinds of things? The answer is absolutely not. And uh, at the end of the day, unless the government gets in hand and cuts everywhere, and I mean, they've got to cut even in the areas which hurt, uh, such as Medicare and Social Security, as well as the military, uh, which are the main areas where they could do unless they do this uh literally it we're going to reach a point of no return and i think we've we've probably passed it already where uh investors of the dollar just say you know what i'm on a hiding to nothing here and they start to move into other assets yeah and with that uh clive <laughs> i uh, think uh, people still have time to try to diversify away from the fiat dollar uh especially with precious metals and that's why i'm going to give a shout out to my uh, affiliates. If you want to find out how to buy uh, physical precious metals, go to the description below uh, of this uh, interview. And, and you can also buy precious metals via a warehouse uh, in Switzerland. That's through the Glint Pay app. So yeah, uh, this is, uh, I mean, uh, another question I have, Clive, because a lot of people are going to say, oh, you've been talking about this for, for years and nothing ever happens. Um, what what do you say uh, to those people? 
a lot of people will think that things will carry on as normal until they don't. Um, you know, it's the old toilet paper story. Uh, we have seen uh, nobody panics and rushes down to the supermarket to buy toilet paper until there's a, a line in the press saying there might be a shortage and suddenly the shelves are empty. And it's the same thing with the dollar or gold or silver. Nobody's going to do anything about it until they collectively uh, have uh, a, a, a crowd-like behaviour. Oh my God, I won't be able to get any. So uh, that, that's the, my first point. So we have to wait for the trigger moment. When the trigger moments, uh, we will see tangible assets being highly desired, and that would include gold and silver. Uh, but it would include anything people can lay their hands on. We might find the, the in, a, in a panic, the shop shelves are emptied, um, which I think would be the excuse for the government to reset the currency. Um, but I think uh, if 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 you take the view that currencies are on a hiding to nothing, and let's face it, the British pound has lost ninety nine percent of its value since nineteen seventy one. The US dollar has not lost ninety seven percent of its value since nineteen seventy one. If you take the view that currencies are heading to zero, it doesn't really matter what you own. If you own tangible assets, they will still be there after the reset. Um, is a reset coming? Well, we've never had one in a major economy up until now. And, and will it be the same as previous resets? No, it'll be different. But the the reality is when you do get a reset, uh, and a reset is when a new currency is brought in to replace the old one, those who hold nominal assets like cash, money market funds, bank deposits, and bonds denominated in the old currency are most likely to find they're left holding those old currencies and they're not convertible to the new currency on a one-to-one -one basis or not convertible at all. Uh, and when when's that going to happen? Uh, my time scale is, obviously, it's, it could be next week or next month if we have a black swan event, but um, I think the idea from the governments of the central banks is to keep kicking the can down the line until uh, they've got the ducks in a row. And what do I mean by the ducks in a row? Well, obviously, that's the, where the central bank digital currency comes in. If they can get the economy up and running on the CBDC, and it's one to one against your other currency, your your bank deposits, your bonds, your cash, your money market fund, and so to the man in the street, the CBDC will look like it's exactly the same thing as the money in your bank. If they can get the economy running on the CBDC, so you're paying your taxes in CBDC, you're receiving your salary in CBDC dollars or pounds, uh, you're pet buying the shops in CBDC, it's a very easy move to say. We're bringing in a temporary restriction on how much of your old bank deposit you can put into the CBDC. Sorry, guys, we've got to do this because there's a lot of hoarders around. They're buying up all the stuff, pushing up prices, making it hard to get food, hard to get this or that or the other. Um, and so temporarily, we'll stop you from putting too much into your CBDC so you can't actually spend it in the shops. But of course, that temporary move will potentially become permanent and if it's permanent, it means that the government is now, or the liability of the government in national debt will be in what is to all intents and purposes, a defunct currency, which from the government's point of view is a brilliant thing because they can now re-leverage, borrow up again in the new CBDC. They can bail out the pension funds. They can bail out the pensioners who, who only had cash in the bank. They can bail out anybody who was unfortunately hard done by. They can introduce a universal basic income to make sure nobody's going to starve. Uh, they can basically look after anybody who's hard done by, by borrowing money, and they'll still have loads and loads left over in terms of what they could borrow without going close to the current debt limits. So they'll be able to start infrastructure programs, employment programs, education programs, all kinds of spending that they're not doing at the moment um, in a, in a, what is, from the government's point of view, a debt-free world. Yeah, and uh, I uh, listened to, I think, Kevin McCarthy, and uh, he's a good actor, I guess, a few months ago, he said, oh, I haven't seen President Biden for 75 days. He doesn't want to negotiate. And he said, uh, we're not going to touch, um, you know, the uh, the one the spending that's mandatory, you know, the Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, and, and he said, we're going to cut discretionary. He said he wasn't going to cut discretionary spending, but he was going to cut the rate of increase to to one percent. 
<laughs> but from what you've told me, they're raising it by 5%. So it, it seems to me that there's no political will on, on both sides to, to solve this problem. So uh, uh, do you think there are people at the at the Treasury, uh, advisors, economic advisors that are so ignorant that they don't see uh, the problem with these projections and the mathematical impossibility of keeping this thing going? Or maybe it's on purpose and they do want to bring everything down and uh, do a reset. Uh, I, I don't think the people who are paid to know these sort of things are ignorant. I think they know exactly what's going to happen. But on the other hand, uh, and, and many, uh, many people in the government also know, uh, but there'll be many who don't. Uh, but the bottom line is, if someone says, uh, we have to cut spending left, right and centre. That means I want to cut spending everywhere except for my pet programme, which deserves more. Uh, so the will to cut spending uh, is the will to cut other people's spending, not the will to cut your own spending. So whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, you have your own uh, pet projects on which you want to spend, whether it be military or social security or, or student loans or whatever it happens to be. Uh, you're not going to want to cut your own pet project, which means that realistically speaking, they're going to, when they when they do have these debt ceiling negotiations, as we just had, um, and that we won't have one for a long time, but when they do have these debt ceiling negotiations, they're going to negotiate with each other. Uh, but the end result is both sides are going to get to spend more, not less. Yeah. And uh, the, you know, the, now we're in a free-for-all where there is actually no limit. They can, anyone can spend anything they like. And... Uh... Maybe you want to show the viewers the uh, the history of the U.S. ten year uh, yield um, to just um, yes, get an idea that what we've had since two thousand uh, is quite extreme compared to uh, where rates were back in the seventies, uh, eighties, and nineties. What you see on the screen at the moment is the ninety in the nineteen eighties the ten year yield. Now you remember. Uh, I took a rate uh, at which the government will run out of money, uh, will I, where the interest on the national debt will exceed the revenue for 2023 uh, of 8.9%, which is on this chart, which you can see the red line here, 8.9%. We're looking at a chart of the 1980s and interest rates of the 1980s, and you can see that there was only one year when the interest rate was below 8% or eight, below 8.9%. 8 that was 1986. For the rest of the time, interest rates were above that level and touched a peak of 15.8% at one point and had quite a bit of time up in the 10s and 12, in double digits and 10, 12%. So the possibility of interest rates being much higher than the 3.2% that they're forecasting in 2033 uh, is absolutely there. But as I said, it's a bit like the game of chess, 10 moves out, you can't actually see the way things will be. We might have interest rates of 30%, or we might have interest rates of minus five. I have no idea. But uh, my view is that it's not going to be minus five, it's got to be much higher. Otherwise, the public won't be buying all that debt that they think they want to buy. If I could just zoom out a little bit, Mario, um, and I zoom out to the last nearly 100 years, or over 100 years here, you can see uh, that after 1971, when we went off, which is which is about here, when we went off the fiat uh, system, or rather when they suspended the gold, uh, when we went onto the fiat system uh, completely 100%, when the gold window was suspended, the interest rates rose rapidly because of the rate of inflation going up. And what's the rate of inflation? The rate of inflation is because they print money. As money is printed, it causes prices to rise. There's more money in the system. People ask for higher salaries. The prices of raw materials go up. And there's more demand for everything. So raw materials go up, salaries go up, and prices of the shops go up. So we had very, very high inflation going up to, uh, I can't remember how much it was in the United States, but it was very high. And that caused interest rates to be quite high. And then we had the uh, advent of technology, which allowed many, many items that we use on a day-to-day -day basis to be made by robots. And that reduced the rate of inflation to, uh, not the rate of monetary inflation, because the money inflation rate remained very high, but it reduced the rate of price increases in the shops to quite low levels of the order of uh, 2 or 3%. And that's when interest rates came down. But there's a limit to how far 
um, inflation, uh, you, how far robotization can reduce prices. Um, so uh, I, there's, suddenly we, we're in a situation where their printing of money is likely to continue to rise in the future based on the spending needs getting bigger and bigger. And yeah. that will you, cause interest rates sorry, to rise. Sorry, Clive. Um, if you could leave that chart there for a second. Uh, oh, can you bring that back, the that 100-year chart? Yeah. Okay. That, because uh, I've spoken about this. If you look at uh, 1941, which is around when the U.S. entered the war, uh, interest rates uh, bottomed. And then they, they went went on rising for like 40 years because they topped in 1981 and then uh from then it, they went they dropped for 40 years and bottomed in 2021 so what i'm trying to say here uh, it seems like there is a 40 year cycle here as well so even um <laughs> you know uh if the fed tries to uh, i think uh negate this cycle we could see a complete collapse of the dollar. Um, but either way, uh, you said that in the 70s, interest rates started going up after Nixon closed the gold window because they were able to inflate the fiat currency. And it seems to me that now they want to inflate everything with all this uh, spending going, you know, a free for all, as you said. Uh, that's right. Uh, th this is the current plan to spend faster and more than they spent ever before in history. And the budget deficit is now, as opposed to what they were forecasting in 2012, which was for the um, budget to uh, more or less stay slightly negative, but more or less balanced, and eventually uh, some years out from here, uh, balancing. Now the forecast is for, is for the budget deficit to get bigger forever and the debt to go up forever. Uh, so, you know, there's been a change in mindset from let's at least have a go in terms of planning to get to some sort of balanced budget to now there is no point in having a balanced budget. Let's just go on increasing forever and ever. Mm. What's the other chart you've got there, the last one? Uh, that's the, the, what we're looking at here is the two-year yield, which you can see has risen uh, over the last 12 months. Um, back at 12 months ago, it was at 0.2%. Not point one percent on a two-year treasury, and we're now at four and a half percent. So we're forty-five times as much interest on the two-year bond or note two-year note as we were back in May last year in May uh, May twenty twenty-one. I beg pardon. Um, so why am I showing this? Well, the government is planning that the interest rate they're going to play on the national debt over the next decade will be two point nine percent, rising to three point two percent. But frankly, the interest rate today, if you have a maturing bond, and if they borrow for two years, which is one of the periods they might borrow for, they're going to be paying 4.5%. And if they borrow uh, at the 10-year rate, which was what we saw over here, just going back, they're going to be borrowing at nearly 4%. So that rate that they are thinking that they're borrowing at oh, for the current year of 28 and uh, for future years of uh, eventually at the end of the period, 32 has no relation to the much higher rates we we have in place today. So I think it's pie in the sky. Yeah, and uh, it's strange because I don't think it's just the government, the politicians um, thinking that rates are going to go lower. Even people on Wall Street, I think uh, they're pushing this um, this narrative that interest rates will get back to like two percent. That uh, there is no inflate, there won't be any inflation. I still hear uh, the Bank of Japan talking about the fact that they want to protect against deflation, even though the CPI there is four percent. And uh, so, yeah, I, I still think that uh, the majority of investors there uh, on Wall Street and uh, speculators. Not all of them. They they're still buying into this narrative that uh, this is a one off. This increase in inflation, everything is going to be uh, go back to like it it has been since the year two thousand. And I think uh, when they realize that that's not the case, uh, and they they see what we see, I, I think that's when uh, the fear and uh, the rush away from from the dollar from paper assets will happen uh is that the way you see it too 
Um, I think so. I mean, the problem the problem is people at the moment are not earning enough to compensate them for inflation. When I was a young lad and uh, as a young worker as well, the interest rate that you got on a bank deposit, uh, in, whether it be in the USA or in the UK, was higher, considerably higher than the inflation rate. That's gone out of the window. For many years, we've had it lower than the current inflation rate, and now it's knocking around something similar. Uh, but I think people are are moving towards expecting real interest rates, particularly if you're paying tax. Uh, you know, you you if you earn four or five percent on your bank deposit, well, you don't get that sort of rate, but uh, you can in a money market fund. If you're earning four percent and you knock off half of that in tax, you're down to two percent. Well, there's no way uh, a, a long-term wealthy investor is going to be happy with two percent when they're inflating the money supply by 15 to 20% and retail prices and consumer prices are rising by six or 7% and probably going at a higher rate in the future. Yeah, so what's your uh, message to the viewers out there, uh, be they young and starting out or you know, working in their midlife or retiring before, before we wrap up uh, today's... Uh... I, but I don't think the social services uh, programs to bail you out and your pension funds are going to be worth very much when you retire. I think you have to make your own provisions and don't rely on your pension fund. If your pension fund uh, somehow is worth something when you eventually retire, all well and good. But I think you need, as an individual, uh, if you don't have too much surplus to cut your spending somewhere so you can put aside some money every month and invest it in tangible assets of some kind, um, and uh, obviously, I'm not 100% all in on gold, but I do think that will be holding its value. But I think you can spread that around and include property, you can include machine, you can include things you might use in the future, you can use, uh, go into equities, and there are other things which are tan realistically going to hold their value over time. Uh, but obviously, a very liquid way to do that will be, uh, seems to be gold and silver. Um, and uh, by the way, Mario, yeah, uh, the, I'm sorry I couldn't come on your last show. I got a call from my uh, bullion dealer who'd got a bunch of um, silver eagles in. Uh, the story was quite interesting. It was a elderly man who'd bought these eagles a few years ago, expecting the entire system to collapse soon. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, due to price rises in the shops, uh, he was running short on spending money. And he brought the eagles. Uh, it was quite a large number. I couldn't buy them all, but I bought some of them. He brought these silver eagles back in the shop. And he made a, uh, according to the bullion dealer, he made a small profit. Um, and then the bullion dealer passed them on to me. I, uh, he, wanted to, he wanted to charge 25% above the silver price. Uh, but I then selectively pulled out a few sales on eBay. Uh, I was a little bit selective, but I, I showed him those and said, look, uh, here's what some other people bought things for and I managed to get it down to about 21% over the silver price. Um, for those who want to buy coins, do bear in mind the spot price is not the same as the price for silver coins and silver bars. These kind of things do trade at quite a reasonable premium. That means whether you're a buyer or seller, you should expect to get more than the silver price for coins because it costs money to mint them. Uh, so those people who uh, go to a, a shop looking to buy one at the silver price will be disappointed. You can't do that. Uh, but before you do go to a shop, make sure you understand the price that you uh, look, look around on the internet, see what prices these things buy and sell for. And then you'll have a good idea what you should be paying if you go into a shop or if you're dealing on eBay or, or person to person. Yeah, and uh, I would say that you you got a good deal on the Silver Eagles at 21%. I think in the States, there are a lot more, the premium. The other thing I would say is that eventually, if uh, what you talked about, uh, all this um, <laughs> uh, uncontrolled spending and deficit spending and uh, uh, borrowing to pay the interest uh, and, and people waking up to the inflation tsunami, I, I think... Uh, you won't be uh, you'll be valuing things in terms of ounces of silver and uh, grams of gold eventually. Right now, if you can still buy <laughs> buy gold and silver relatively close to the spot price, that means the system still 
okay. But when things uh, get get really crazy, uh, the dealers might even close shop for a while because they, they don't know what where the price is. So there you go, Clive. Uh, thank you for coming on again. And uh, I, I wish you a, a great uh, rest of the week. Thank you very much, Mary. It's great talking with you and your listeners. Thank you.